times I think about it, and I think I have just never really connected as well as I think I should, or I would like to, with the whole idea <clears throat> about being part of the foundation, or being part of, of the building of the Church of Christ, with Him as the foundation, <clears throat> and being um, the temple of the living God. Um, um, I just, you know, I mean, I know that that's true, and I understand that, but I don't always, you know, just, I guess, connect with it like I would like to. And um, so I've been challenged as I've been reading and studying and stuff. Um, I've been challenged with that whole idea. Let me just do work here. Um, I don't know how. Excuse me. I don't know how much I emphasized talking about this last week. But when I think back to the Acts 2 church and what that church was like, you, do you remember reading that? You know, what that was like back in, in, in the early days? You know, it talks about people being devoted to each other and to the word and spending much time together in each other's homes and having all things in common. Um, that means people who were not doing well financially or, or with, with resources, people who were doing well would come and they would share together so that everybody had their needs met. And um, I also think, I had another one rolling around in my brain, um, one of the things that has struck me about the early church is that the people who went to the early church intently studied the scriptures. Paul encouraged them to do this, to make sure that what Paul and the other disciples were sharing were from God, were from the Word. The people intently studied the scriptures. They were checking up on, on their leaders. And I think that that's probably a good thing. I would love it if you guys came to me and said, Pastor, you said this and this and this. Faye does this, but nobody else. This, this, and this. Now, are you sure that's what scripture says? Here's what I read. And it'd be, I mean, it'd be, it'd be fun if you were all so involved in the scriptures that, that we encouraged one another like scripture talks about. We built up one another like scripture talks about. Spurred each other on to good works, like the scripture talks about. Anyway, no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's the foundation, and he's the one that laid it. That's 1 Corinthians 3, 11, it looks like. And I think I have that in another form. Yeah. No man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Nobody can lay the foundation for the church, basically, except... Jesus said, he is the foundation. And I had this reference, but I forgot to save it. So it's somewhere, I think, in 2 Peter, but it says, living stones are being built into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You know what that is, honey? 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2, yeah, 2. Like that. So uh, we, are, we are the living stones. And we're not living stones until we are filled with the Holy Spirit. We're not filled with the Holy Spirit until Jesus becomes part of our life as we accept his death on the cross for us. His blood bought. I mean, he, he bought us with the price, his death. So we are part of the living stones that are on the foundation. Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. And that's in Ephesians 2.20. So I'm... I'm going to be talking about that foundation this morning, and then I'm going to move into what it means to be the temple of the living God next week. I won't touch on that at the end of this week, but I've been wanting to do this for a long time. I've threatened to do it. I remember when um, Joyce Luter was here before she left. It may have been before her husband died. I said, you know, there's some great songs. There's some great hymns that have great theology. A lot of hymns do. Most of them do, probably. And it would be fun just to preach on him sometime because there's such great, you know, theology. Well, for the last two or three weeks, I put in your bulletin a great hymn of the church, a wonderful hymn. And much to your chagrin, possibly, I'm going to sing the first verse to you. And this is, I'm going to talk about this this morning. The first verse of this song, um, The Church is One Foundation. You can sing with me if you know it. It goes like this. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ the Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From 
heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. I mean, know that song, that hymn. Just not just a hymn, a little bit. That's a wonderful hymn. Now, there's other verses in there. I may do a full set some other time, but this morning, I would like to talk about this thing a little bit because it has such a strong, um, hmm, a, a, just a strong teaching about the Word of God. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is His new creation. That's the church. She, she is His, Jesus Christ, new creation by water and the Word. That's the Holy Spirit. Water is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. The Word comes into our life through the Holy Spirit, teaches us. From heaven he came and saw her, the church. Jesus came from heaven to be his holy bride. The church is identified as the she, and it's the bride. We'll share some scripture with you. With his own blood, he bought her, and for her life he died. And that refers to the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, but more importantly, the resurrection. So the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ through the Lord. As I was doing some research, I found this I found the scripture that said an understandable version. There was a whole list, list of versions on this particular scripture, but this is called an understandable version. I never heard of that. But it says you are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself being the principal stone by which the entire building is aligned. You are, you and I, as believers, are built on the foundation that the apostles and prophets, they were involved with that foundation with Jesus Christ as the principal stone by which the entire building was aligned. I may have shared this with you, but when I was in Israel, I saw some amazing architectural um, miracles, I guess, for lack of a better word. And in Jerusalem, the temple, we were we went underground where, where there were huge stones that they had brought in as the foundation for the temple. And Guys, those stones were at least, many of them, the size of this building and larger. And they had people, just regular people, probably not like me, because we had a thousand or two thousand people, we couldn't move the stone. But those Egyptians, they were who were they? Were they were tough people. And they moved those stones. Some they, they carved them out and they moved those stones in place. It was just amazing. Well, you know probably as well as I do that a foundation, a, a solid Foundation is essential for a strong building. And it's it's important that it be squared and perfect measure wise. I remember as a little boy, I think it was just I was in preschool or just my first year. We lived in Wenatchee, Washington, and my dad decided to build a house for his family. And he he started by building a two-car garage. That was developed into a two-bedroom home, I guess, and then eventually they were going to build a house. I remember though watching him as he built the foundation for that house and how meticulous he was in measuring that out and making sure it's all perfect um, in terms of that square and all fit together well before the truck came and poured the cement. And I watched him as that was all, all was done. And I couldn't help him because I was too little, but it was just amazing to observe that. So a strong foundation is essential for a house. This house, this church, building has a strong foundation under it. Don't know anything about it, but it has to have a strong foundation. So that's the kind of foundation we're talking about, is something that's built with a strong cornerstone, a strong, perfect, exact um, foundation where that it can be built on. And we are part of that foundation. So the scripture goes on to say in 1 Peter 5.10, And may the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, us after suffering a little while may the God of all grace himself thoroughly prepare you he will establish strengthen and provide a foundation so God Jesus Christ has established and strengthened and provided that foundation that we are built on and and we are called to be part of that from his, his eternal glory so the church is one foundation the foundation of the church that's him the body of Christ. When we talk about the church and the body of Christ, they're synonymous. They're the same thing. So Jesus is the foundation, and we build on that when we have him present in our life. 
She is his new creation by water and the word. It's, it's, I'm going to be using the scripture. It's found in Ephesians 5, 25, 27. We're going to be using this for the next three sections, I think. And the focus of this is not husbands loving your wives, although this is a good portion of scripture for husband, husbands to remember. But it says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. He didn't give himself up for your wives. He gave himself up for the church. If I would have read that, I may have read that incorrectly. That he gave himself up for the wives, and us husbands need to give ourselves up for the wives, which is probably a good thing. But he gave himself up for the church, which is his bride, which is kind of related to his, uh, a feminine gender, I guess, in Scripture. He gave himself up for her to sanctify her. That means make her perfect, pure, and holy. Cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. By the Holy Spirit speaking to and ministering to and cleansing the individuals that we're talking about. Which is basically the body. And to present her, the church, his bride, to himself as a glorious church. Without stain or wrinkle or any such blemish but holy and blameless. So he's talking about you and I being without stain or wrinkle or any such blemish, but holy and blameless. All of us together who are temples of the living God, that's the way we are. How does that happen? I mean, how does that happen that you and I don't have stains and we're not wrinkled? I mean, I'm kind of wrinkled. We don't have blemishes. We're holy and blameless. How does that happen? Through Christ. And... How does Christ do that? Yeah, it's called the imputation of righteousness. Not the imputation, but he, he imputes righteousness. We are holy and righteous. So, in spite of our ugliness sometimes, he makes us holy and pure. So that when we together, as the body of Christ and the church, are presented to him, it's without blemish, stain, wrinkle. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. Again, husband loves your wife. Husbands love your wives, just as Christ loved the church, and gave himself up for her to make her holy. He came and sought her to be his holy bride. He came and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her the church by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. That's an amazing thing for me to think about. My, my suspicions are you too are amazed when you think about the fact that God and all his glory and omnipotence and everything, the creator of this whole universe, came as a child from Jesus Christ to earth. And his purpose was to claim his bride, to provide a way for us to be part of his family, part of the bride of Christ. He came to do that. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. So, the same scripture says, Husbands, love your wife. Wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's what Jesus did when he came. You know the story. I know the story. But it's good for me to be reminded, and probably you too, that he, in fact, gave his life for us to be where we are today. Part of the church, part of the family of God, part of his body. So, and gave himself up for her to make her holy. His death, his provision on the cross, is what allows us to be washed clean with water through the word, to be holy. So that we can be presented, uh, so we can be presented to himself as the way of the church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless, Ephesians 5, 25, 27. So if you think about it, if you think about what he's done, and who we are in Christ Jesus, that would cause me to conclude that you and I are sacred. I don't know if you've ever thought about yourself being sacred, but if the Holy Spirit is present in us, that's the temple of the living God. If you read much about the story of the temple and the, the Ark of the Covenant, um, years ago, decades ago, when um, in the Old Testament time, um, God allowed them to... Um, and instructed them to build this ark. It was a, uh, I don't know how big it was, I've read this, but I don't know, something like that. And it had the scrolls in it um, that um, the Ten Commandments were on. And, but it also, uh, on the top, it was overlaid with what was called the mercy seat. 
the FEMA, the mercy seat, and that, that was what, I think it was once a year, some of you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but once a year, the, um, the priests were allowed to come in, and they, and they poured blood on that mercy seat, and it was for the atonement of their sins and the sins of the people. But they could not do that more than once a year. There were occasions when people, a priest or whomever, for some reason, um, touched the Ark of the Covenant or did something, and, they, and God took them out because he had requirements and expectations, and they didn't follow through. I'm not sure if I got the king right. I think it's Uzziah. He was a king who was walking along with the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the, of the Covenant slipped, and he, he reached out to, to keep it from falling, and God took him out. There was another thing. I, I forget what this whole story was, but there were 70, there were 70 um, people, Israelites, who God took out because I think they looked on the Ark of the Covenant when they weren't supposed to. So it was a very significant, important, holy um, place. That's where God is supposed to go, where he's supposed to live. Also seems to me that when I was in Israel and I was I was at the temple, the thing that upset me the most about my trip to um, to Israel was the Dome of the Rock. If I remember correctly, that is now owned by and controlled by the Muslims. And I thought to myself, how, 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 how stupid is that? I mean, that's where, that, that was an important part of, of Jesus' life and ministry. And now the Muslim has, Muslims have control of it. What I was going to say is I think there are speculations that that ark is buried down somewhere deep down there. And there may be an attempt to excavate that out somewhere. I don't know. Did you guys watch the Raiders of the Lost Ark? Yeah, that was kind of interesting. Play on what happened with that. But, um, but God changed the plan. And he went from, um, from being supposed to be in this ark to offering to walk with the people and to be with the people and to live with them. Um, yeah, I'll get there in just a minute. But you and I are sacred because of what Jesus has done for us. And so scripture says, so now you Gentiles, all of us who are not Jews, our Gentiles, are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together, we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. That's all of us. So through him, we are also being made part of his glory where God lives by his spirit. And then a portion of scripture I think that's really cool is in 1 Corinthians where it says, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and the spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys this, this temple. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and the spirit of God lives in you? Don't you realize that you are the temple of God Spirit of God lives in you. I remember as a child, that scripture was used quite a bit to try to motivate us or encourage us to live a good life, a holy life. Um, like, like we were cautioned as Quaker young people, I would imagine it was that way for you too, for you grew up in, but you wouldn't drink any booze, any alcohol, because don't you know that you're a temple of living God? You wouldn't smoke, because don't you know that you're a temple of living God? Any number of other things you would not do because you're the temple of the living God. I forget what it was called. Maybe it's Women's Temperance Union. As a grade school boy, I was in, encouraged to learn poetry and speak it at the Women's Tem Temperance Union. And it had all to deal, all to do with being temperate in terms of what you ingested into your body. That was probably healthy for me. It influenced me in a positive way. Sometimes it seemed like it was overkill, but I didn't know it then. It was but I think I think the important thing is for us to realize it's not what we do so much. But am I aware? Are you aware that through the Holy Spirit, God resides in my life? And so, as important as that temple was back in biblical times, that temple now resides in you. That you are the temple of, because the Holy Spirit is in you. And we collectively, as part of that building that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. We are the temple together. When we think about that, it would seem to me that that should make a lot of difference how we think and how we act. 
in our, in our life, in our relationship with each other and others. Next week, I'm going to be talking a bit more about this. But we are a small piece of heaven and a small part of the eternal plan. So, um, yeah, if you, if you have some time this week, you know, do some, do some reading about the temple. You know, Google it. Scriptures on the temple. The temple of Jesus Christ. I do that sometimes when I want to see all the scriptures that deal with a certain type of subject. I Google it that way. So, yeah, do that if you can. Now, next week we do have a round table, so it'll be two weeks from